In this chapter, we're going to look at uh, basic concepts of probability, addition rule, and multiplication rule, complements and conditional probability, counting, uh, and we're going to mention probability through uh, simulation. The objectives that are covered, we're going to look at uh, the concept of a sample space, probability of an event, uh, classical and empirical probability, probability for compound events using addition rule, using multiplication rules, and discovering conditional probability. Finding the total number of outcomes in a sequence of events, find the number of ways that R objects can be selected from N objects using permutation and also combination and finding the probability of an event using counting rules. So we looked at uh, measures of center, mean, median, mode, mid-range, and we discussed how your GPA is calculated, known as the weighted mean, even weighted average. Normally we use the word and terminology mean instead of average in statistics. Measures of variations, we looked at uh, how variance is calculated and standard deviation using population as well as sample. In real world, we really don't have access to a population. So almost always we use the sample variance as well as the sample standard deviation. We discussed Chebyshev's theorem, range, rule of thumb, mu plus minus two sigma, uh, to calculate the range. CV, known as coefficient of variance, and empirical rule, which simply put, it applies to a bell shape, a symmetrical distribution, in which case, when you start from the mean and you go one standard deviation away on each side, it gives us about 68% of the data. If we go by two standard deviations away, it covers about 95%. And that's why it is considered the range rule of thumb dealing with two standard deviations, because on a normal basis, two standard deviations is also 95%, and 95% is normally a good percentage. If you go by three standard deviations away, it covers almost everything known as almost everything 99.7%. And of course, as you can see at the bottom, right, giving you how to use a TI calculator to put the information in and do the calculation. Measures of relative standing and box plot, we looked at the Z-score, that's the concept known as curving, when you ask your instructors, do you care? That's what it means, Z equals X minus X bar over S, or X minus mu over sigma. K is a percentile, we can calculate the value of the K, we can find out the location. So the idea of a percentile locator was discussed. And the main reason was to get to Q1, Q2, and Q3, known as quartiles, that separate the entire data into four equal parts. Now, to find them, there are two ways. One was discussed using this concept of a percentile. And the easy way out when I mentioned you cut the data into half, the bottom half, so that would be uh, how you find the median, which becomes Q2. And then the bottom half, you find the median again, that would be Q1. And for the top half, that would make it, when you find the median, that would make it Q3. We had discussed the concept of outliers, but what are outliers? Basically something which is out of normal. But how do you know that? Mathematically speaking, we calculate as follows. A value which is less than Q1 minus 1.5 IQR. IQR by definition is Q sub 3 minus Q sub 1. Or if a value is larger than Q3 by 1.5 plus IQR, beyond those two are considered outliers. We also have extreme outliers where we use three times IQR instead of 1.5. And then this side, you know, we cut it into 10 equal parts, but more importantly, five number summary, which consists of the min, the max, 
and three core types in between Q1, Q2, Q3, and they give us the box, box plot. We're gonna get to the new stuff. All right, let's discuss the basic concepts of probability. I really can't emphasize this enough for us to really get this if nothing else out of probability, and it goes as follows. The notation P of A represents probability, but the probability is always between zero and one. Can it be zero? Yes. Can it be one? Yes. Can it be negative? Can it be larger than one? The answer is no to both of them. So you want to be very careful. So that's an extremely important property of probability. The other one is that the probability should add up to one. The only time it doesn't. So this is the first one. This is the second one. The only time it doesn't, if we do it due to round of error. So that's why we want to carry a lot of decimals. Again, for the sake of homework, you got to follow how many decimals they want you to put in to get full credit. But generally speaking, if we put a lot of decimals, it adds up accordingly. And the only time that it is okay if you end up with the sum that is very close to one. Because of the round of error, you may end up with one point zero 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 one something like that or zero point nine 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 that's okay because it's due to round of error otherwise if you write it as fractions add them up precisely it ends up being total of one now if an event cannot occur we call it an impossible set that means the probability is zero when an event has a, a probability of one or 100%, we call it a sure set. So probability is one or 100%. Now, the next one is complementary event. The notation is A bar. Sometimes they call it A naught. It consists of all outcomes that are not included in the outcomes of event A. In other words, probability of a complement is one minus the probability of A. Many times people confuse the odds with probability. And the reason they do because odds is, is discussed when, for example, you play a lottery and so on and so forth, but they are not the same. The reason they could be close if the probability is small, extremely small, then the odds and probability become almost the same. But if the probability is not that small, they are completely different. So the way the odds are defined, the odds, normally when we hear that, it's defined as odds against an event A. So an, against an event A, it is defined as probability of A complement over the probability of A. And it is normally expressed in the form of A to B, where both of them are integers, whole numbers. Now, the actual odd in favor of an event is P of A over P of A bar or A naught or A complement, okay? The reciprocal of that. So if odds against an event is A to B, then for it would be B to A. And this is the probability. This is the odds. This one is close. It is close to probability of A. If probability is extremely small. And that's why the confusion. I want to make sure everybody is comfortable with the concept. So with that being the case, the next thing we want to define is a payoff odds against an event. Payoff odds is defined as net profit over the amount of bet. So therefore, if you do the cross product, A over B equals C over D, then AD equals BC. This is known as a cross product. So net profit times the denominator for the left side is one. So simply net profit is payoff odds against an event A times the amount of bet. Normally we want to come up with the exact fraction or decimal. Exact fraction is always better. Again, you just follow the instruction when we are rounding, we go with three significant digits. Basics of probability. Probability can be defined as the chance of an event occurring. It can be used to quantify what the odds 
are that a specific event will occur. A probability experiment is a chance process that leads to well-defined results called outcomes. An outcome is the result of a single trial of a probability experiment, an event that consists of any collection of results or outcomes of a procedure. A simple event is an outcome or an event that cannot be further broken down into simpler components. A sample space is a set of all possible outcomes or simple events of a probability experiment. How to interpret probability values, which are expressed as values between 0 and 1. A small probability, such as 0.001, corresponds to an event that rarely occurs. Odds and their relations to probabilities. Odds are commonly used in situations such as lotteries and gambling. Uh, so one of the things that is extremely important here is the concept of a sample space. It is the collection of all possible events. So that's important for everybody to know. What I'd like you to look at, this is something that is used by statisticians. When you look at the values of probabilities, of course, we said zero is an impossible set and one is a sure or certain set. In between, of course, everybody knows the meaning of 50-50. Likely is close is up there, close to 100%, if you will, and unlikely is close to an impossible set. So but it doesn't have a specific value. Just to give you an idea, let's start with a simple example to make some sense out of this. We want to come up with a concept of a sample space. So look at an experiment, an experiment of tossing a coin. We have only two outcomes, heads and tails. That would be writing as H comma t, that would be a short-hand notation. All right, so that would be a sample space. The sample space contains two outcomes. We roll a die, a normal die has six sides, and it starts from one and it goes all the way to six. There are six outcomes. True, false, I mean, it just says true and false. There are two outcomes, and it works like tossing a coin as far as the number of outcomes. There are two outcomes. Now, what happens if we toss a coin two times or toss two coins? Now, it's important to understand how that works. And there are four outcomes, and it can be done by the method of three diagram as follows. For example, H, T. A three diagram is that the one that puts the outcomes on a branch. So this is the first stage, or you can say the first toss, or the first coin. Now, in order for you to go to the next, it is a good idea to keep the track by having the H at top again, and T at the bottom. Does it make any difference if you don't do that? No, but it helps if we are consistent. And so this one is H, H, T, T, H, and TT giving us four outcomes. So this is one way to come up with the answer. Basically, the number of outcomes uh, raised to the power of number of stages. We'll, we have two outcomes, if you will, and there are two stages because there are two cones, so it's two squared or four outcomes as a sample space. If we have, let's say, four coins, the number of outcomes would be two to four. If we have five coins, we have two to the power of five, 32. So the number of outcomes per stage, each stage, each coin has only two outcomes. And that is being raised to a proper power. We are continuing with the concept of a simple event and sample space. We are uh, looking at the table given. We're going to use B to denote a baby boy and G to denote a baby girl. So procedure and experiment. Single birth, the event could be one girl, for example. So what would be the sample space? We're going to use B and G. But what if we have three birds? Uh, an example of an event would be two boys and one girl. Now, it's important to see that if we say two boys and one girl, there are different ways that they're going to happen. So just for the sake of argument, what do we mean by B, B, G? That means the first is a boy, the second is a boy, and the third one is a girl.
But what do we mean by B, G, B? The first one is a boy, the second one is a girl, and the third one is a boy. And so I think everybody gets the picture. And so for each birth, there are two possibilities because there are three births. We have two cubed or eight outcomes. And you can easily do the three diagram that was mentioned. As an example, you can say B and G, then this goes as to the second stage or the second birth. And this is the third one. This is one stage, meaning the first, the second, and the third. And as you can see, for example, the top would be B, B, B. That's how you write it. You can write it out and there ends up being eight outcomes. Now, what's a simple event? One birth, the result of one girl in a simple event, and so is the result of one boy. If we are looking at single birth, so the very first case. Now, in the next case, when we have three births, the result of two girls followed by a boy, as an example, GGB as an example. That is considered a simple event. However, the event of two girls and one boy, I want you to see the difference between these two. When you look at this one, it's very specific, very specific. GGB, two girls and one boy, in that order. But this event, two girls and a boy, in any format that works, and there are three outcomes. This is no longer a simple event. It is known as a compound event. So as mentioned before, the sample space consists of two cubed or eight outcomes or eight simple events as listed above. We want to find the sample space for rolling uh, one die and then two dies. First, I think one is very clear. There are six sides, and therefore there are six outcomes, numbers one through six. But how many outcomes do we have in the second case? There are two stages. In each stage, we roll a die, or you can say rolling two dice. It works the same way. Each stage contains six outcomes. There are two of them. So would be six squared. If you have three of them, would be six cubed, so on and so forth. That's the way it works. Now, one easy way to put them together is using this table. See the, how it works. You go from one to six at top row and the left column, and you put them together. You start with one, 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 two, three, four, five, six. So that would be one. And then you go all the way down in the same manner. Now you do it with number two and number three, and eventually the last one would be six, six. And so there are six squared, 36 outcomes, and what I want you to pay attention to is the formula that I'm going to give you. It's not in the text. How do you find N of S? Or sometimes they call it just S, the sample space, the size of a sample space. That would be the number of outcomes per stage. What do we mean by that? You toss a coin, there are two outcomes. You roll a die, there are six outcomes. That would be number of outcomes in each stage. Now, to the power of number of stages, what do we mean by number of stages? Well, two coins, that means two stages in essence, or four birds, that means four stages. When you roll a die five times, that means the number of stages is five. This is a good question as a probability warm-up. What is the probability of getting snake eyes? Uh, when we get two ones, uh, it's called snake eyes. And what would be the probability of that? Any ideas? Anybody want to share with us their answer? 
one out of 36. Beautiful. Beautiful. One over 36. Because the probability is defined as, so probability of an event is N of A over N of S. So the number of ways event A can happen over the whole sample space. Event A, in this case, there's only one way, which means one, one. There is no other way. So there's only one outcome. The numerator is one. And how many outcomes total? 36, and we're done. All right, let's move on. Common approaches to finding a probability, there are three of it. One is the classical approach. Classical probability uses sample spaces to determine the numerical probability that an event will happen and assumes that all outcomes in the sample space are equally likely to occur. And we have seen those examples already. And in short, the probability is defined as the number of the outcomes that we are interested in over the total number of possible outcomes. The total number of possible outcomes is known as sample space. Now I'm showing you a different notations here. Uh, in some cases and in some text, S is used to represent the sample uh, space. Now I want you to be exposed to that but I want you to realize at the same time, we are not bogged down with just the formula that they give us, we understand the concept. And uh, so as an example, probability of even number in roll of a dice would be the total number of even numbers that we have. We have two, four, six, there are three of it. Over the total number of outcomes, there are six sides. So three over six. Needless to say, we can simplify it as in one half. In the case of an empirical probability uh, known as relative frequency uh, also or approximation of probability, we have an observation if you will. So we conduct or observe a procedure and count the number of times that event A occur. P of A is then approximated as, as I mentioned in the previous one, N of A over N, if you will, or in our procedures repeated. It's important to know the total number of outcomes is always the denominator, is always the sample space. And uh, the specific event of interest, that would be the total number of that happening as the numerator. So probability of randomly selected student from a statistic class to be a female, for example, would be the number of female students over the total. Okay, so just for the sake of argument, if we have 40 students in class, let's just say 21 students are females, would make it 21 over 40. That's just uh, an event that follows a relative frequency as an approximation. So with that being the case, let's look at this last one. Subjective probability. P of A, the probability of event A, is estimated by using knowledge of the relevant circumstances. A subjective probability can be estimated in the absence of historical data. It uses a probability value based on an educated guess or estimate employing opinions and inexact information. Experiments that have neither equally likely outcomes nor the potential of being repeated are assigned by subjective probability. Examples, weather forecasting, predicting outcomes of sporting events. This last paragraph. Simulations. Sometimes none of the preceding three approaches can be used. A simulation of a procedure is a process that behaves in the same ways as the procedure itself so that similar results are produced. Probabilities can sometimes be found by using a simulation. Sometimes it's either impossible to do a procedure or it's easier to do the simulation. It can be done that way and computer or technology is used to do so. We want to look at this example. When a single die is rolled, what is the probability of getting a number less than seven? And simply put, if you call the event E, probability of E is N of E over 
n of s. If you call it a, probability of a is n of a over n of s. And the denominator is the sum. We already know there are six sides. So we already have the idea as far as the denominator. As you know, all numbers obviously are less than seven. So this is a sure event because every number is less than seven. Six over six gives us 100%. And this is known as a sure set or a certain set. The next one is asking for numbers that are larger than two. So what numbers are larger than two? You can just write them out. If you write those numbers, you see there are four of them. So pretty much four over six or two thirds. Even numbers, again, you can write them. And that gives you 50%, one half. Finally, the number that is larger than seven. Is there any number that is larger than seven? And we don't have that. So that can't happen. That is known as an impossible set. Here's the next example. For the gender of the children, if a family has three children, use B for boy and G for girl. Use a tree diagram, a graph of possible outcomes of a procedure to find the sample space for the gender of three children in a family. As I mentioned before, the number of outcomes, the total sample size, is the number of outcomes per stage to the power of number of stages. In this case, there are two outcomes and there are however many children, four children, five children, eight children, that would be the exponent. In this case, two cubed equals eight. If we look at the tree diagram, Again, we want to be consistent. So branches B and G. If you put the B at top, you just keep on with the same thing. If you put the G at top, the same thing. Just be consistent. The next one happens, take a look at the next stage. That means the next birth in this case. So for the sake of argument, if we had Two birds would be BB, BG, GB, and GG. But there is one more. This is the third stage. And so the very top one gives us B, 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 and the very bottom one gives us G, 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 and anything in between. And so we write it out in a set. We use braces to represent a set. So we've got the sample space. So if a family has three children, find the probability that two of the children are girls. So let's see how we arrive at it. It simply means we are looking for two Gs, and that's why I put them in a different color. When we go back to this either tree diagram or the set, we notice this one, this one, and this one contains two G's. And of course, we really need to understand the meaning of it. So I'm going to repeat because I said that last time, but it's extremely important to understand the meaning of BGG versus GBG. When you look at the first one, it means, this means the first birth was a boy, the second one was a girl, the third one was a girl. Whereas GBG means the first one is a girl, the second one is a boy, and the third one is a girl. And so there are three of them out of eight. So that's how we arrive at three over eight. Here's a relative frequency example, an empirical probability. If there were nearly three million skydiving jumps and 24 of them resulted in deaths, find the probability of dying when making a skydiving jump. So according to this, we just use the relative frequency, 24 out of three million. That's the idea. So we use the empirical approach, the classical approach cannot be used because two outcomes, dying and surviving, are not equally likely. However, conceptually, they are similar in, in that basically we use the, N, in essence, N of A over N of S, okay? Conceptually, they are very close though. So with that being the case, P of death is N of death over N of skydiving, which is 24 over 3 million. We simplify and we get zero point, bunch of zeros and eight. Now, it's important to know 
Although at some point it was mentioned maybe three significant digits, we don't want to mix them up and make a mistake with the number of decimals that one can use. In this case, if somebody says, okay, I'm going to use four decimals, for example, or even three decimals and things like that, you may end up with zero. So it's really not a good practice. If need be, you carry out more decimals. It's important to pay attention to that. In a high school, it was found that 450 of them texted while driving in a semester and 550 did not do so. According to these results, if a high school driver is randomly selected, find the probability that he or she texted while driving during the same time period. We can set up this table. Those who texted, the size is 450. Those who didn't is 550. We are dealing with a total of 1,000 students. We use the same relative frequency, if you will, 450 over 1,000 is the answer. Now notice, of course, you can write it as 0 0.45. If you want to keep it as a fraction, it's absolutely fine. You get 45 over 100, and then you can divide the top by five and the bottom by five. So if you want to report this as a fraction, perfect. Make sure you have 450 over 1,000, so your reader can see where you get the numbers from, and then the simplified version. So you really want to show your reader both of them. This one is to tell them, okay, where I get the numbers from. And the last one shows, okay, I know my math, I can simplify. There is a 45% or 0.45 probability that if a high school driver is randomly selected, he or she texted while driving during the last semester. In a sample of 50 people, 21 had type O blood, 22 had type A blood, 5 had type B blood, and 2 had type AB blood. Set up a frequency distribution and find the following probabilities. A person has type O, a person has type A or type B, a person has neither type A nor type O, a person does not have type AB. So we have the type in one column, A22, B, we are going in an order of alphabetical order in essence. You don't have to do that by any means. You can start with O and write 21. But at A, we have 22 of them. B, there are five. A, B is two. And O is 21, total of 50. So that would be the frequency distribution table. So let's look at uh, the first one. It says a person has type O blood. So type O is what? How many? You want N of O over N of S in essence. So 21 over 50. So you have 21 of those. And so you're going to write 21 over 50. If it gets simplified, so be it. If not, you can leave it. So that would be part A. Part B is asking a person has type A or type B. And there's nothing in common. So A and B, we add them up. 22 plus 5 over 50. And again, we simplify if we can. The next one, a person has neither type A, that means type A is out, nor type O. So A is out. I'll put the X mark next to it. That means forget it. O is out, I put the X mark next to that. So what is left is B and AB, five and two, seven. So seven over 50, seven over 50. The last part, part D says a person doesn't have type AB. So that means AB is out and everything else is in. So I put, a red circle next to it. So that means AB is out. So basically 52 of them is out is 48 over 50. And it ends up being 48 over 50 or 24 over 25 because we need to simplify whenever we can. The concept of a complementary events as far as the probability is concerned, probability of A complement or A bar or A naught is known as one minus probability of A complementary events.
let's read these events, rolling a die and getting a four, a complement of that would be everything except four. Selecting a letter of the alphabet and getting a vowel. Getting a consonant, assume Y is a consonant. Next. Select getting a month that begins with a J. The answer is? Getting February, March, April, May, August, September, October, November, or December. Everything except the ones that start with J, obviously. Selecting a day of the week and getting a weekday. Getting Saturday or Sunday. So the complement of an event A denoted by A bar A naught consists of all outcomes that are not included in the outcomes of event A. Therefore, probability of A naught or the complement of A can be calculated as one minus probability of A. If there were nearly 3 million skydiving jumps and 24 of them resulted in death, find the probability of not dying when making a skydiving jump. We've already done the calculation, 24 out of 3 million. The complementary event is of interest to us, one minus that. It's important to see according to the given, we want the probability of its complement, one minus 0.00. .00 Zero, 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 0008. We need to carry out a lot of decimals. More boys are born than girls. In one typical group, there are 205 newborn babies, 105 of whom are boy boys. If one baby is randomly selected from the group, what is the probability that the baby is not a boy? So what we are looking at, the idea of a complementary event, probability of not a boy be complement B not one minus the probability of boys, that becomes a probability of girls. 100 over 205, or you can say 205 minus 105 over 205, however you want to put that. You can simplify the fraction. If you simplify the fraction, divide by 5, 20 over 41, or you can put it into a decimal format. The actual odds against event A. The actual odds against event A occurring are the ratio P over the probability of the complement over the probability of the event, usually expressed in the form A to B or, or A to B, where A and B are integers having no common factors. The actual odds in favor event A occurring are the reciprocal of the actual odds against the event. If the odds are against A are A to B, then the odds in favor of A are B to A. It's important to pay attention to the definition of odds. Most of the time, we are interested in odds against, but understand, odds for, in this case, odds in favor is written as O of A is P of A over P of A naught. P of A bar, P of A complement. The actual odds against, look at this one. This is the, the two are reciprocals of each other. Two are, so that's the definition. And I want you to look at the actual odds in favor. When you look at that, odds for A has the probability of A at top. If the probability of A is extremely small, then probability of its complement is almost one, and that's why they seem to be the same. So when the probability is extremely small, for all practical purposes, they become the same. But they are not, and that's important for everybody to know. And so we have the definition of a payoff odd. The payoff odds against event A represent the ratio of the net profit, if you win, to the amount bet. Payoff odds against event A equals net profit to amount bet. Payoff odds against event A, oh, I just did that. Net profit equals payoff odds against event A times amount bet. So payoff odds against A is the ratio of the net profit to the amount of bet. So therefore, what is your net profit is the product of the two, the payoff odds and the amount of bet that you put in. Let's look at an example. If you bet $5 on the number 13 in roulette, your probability of winning is 1 in 38, but your payoff odds are given, are given by a casino as 35 to 1. Find the actual odds against the outcome of 13. How much net profit would you make if you win by betting $5 on 13? If the casino was not operating for profit and the payoff odds were changed to match the actual odds against 13, how much would you win if the outcome were 13? 
Let's stick with the definitions. So we want to find the actual odds against the outcome of 13. So we follow the formula. At the very top in blue, we have the formula and we just put it in. Remember, the probability of winning is 1 over 38, and that is the probability of A. So the top is 1 minus 1 over 38. The bottom is 1 over 38. This is a simple case. We get 37, and we normally write it as 37 over 1 or 37 to 1. I want you to pay attention why I wrote it as 37 over 1, because they like us to write it as a ratio of two integers. So 37 to 1, and I'm assuming everybody is comfortable with the complex fraction and can simplify it for the problem. When you're looking at this fraction, which is a complex fraction, you can multiply the top and the bottom by 38. It goes away, becomes 37, and we write 37 as 37 to 1. So that would be the actual odd against the outcome. So how much net profit? We mentioned the net profit is basically the product of the payoff odds and the amount of bet. Now, what is the payoff odds? So using that, 35 times five, okay, I'm using the formulas that we have discussed. Net profit, we said it's payoff odds against an event times the amount of bet. And the payoff odds uh, by casino, they give us 35 to one. So it's 35 times the amount of bet was five bucks. So it's 175. Dollars. Now, it is extremely important for us to understand how much we collect. We collect $175, and the amount of bet is not going away. So we keep our, our own five bucks. This is the way the payoff odds work. So I want you to be very careful when you look at this versus when you play a lottery. If you pay uh, two bucks, three bucks, one dollar, five bucks, however amount of money that you pay uh, for lottery, when you win, the amount that you paid will come off as your net gain, if you will. Whereas here, the amount of money that you put in to play, it's not going to go away. If you break even, they don't touch your bet. If you lose, they take away your bet. If you win, your bet is intact and then they give you $175. That means you keep your own money, okay? So it is your net profit, which is 175. This is something that I've seen students uh, sometimes making a mistake with, so be very careful with that. Having said that, so if the casino were not operating for profit, obviously they are, then the uh, payoff odds wouldn't be 35 to one. The payoff odd would be what we found in part A. So they got to give us 37 times that. So pay attention where number 37 to one comes from. That comes from part A, we did the calculation. So they would give us 185. And obviously if they paid, that would be considered a fair gain and they wouldn't make any money. And that's why they don't pay as much. Uh, professor, I just have one question. Go ahead. Um, when it's the 35 over one, I get that, that, that what, what happens to the one? Because I, I understand that 35 is 35 to one. That means two. 35. In fact, if you look at part A, the answer is 37. But the way we want to represent that, instead of saying 37, okay, so for example, part A is 37. So for part A, we say 37 or 37 to one or 37 to one. They want us to show it in one of these two formats instead of saying 37. So that one is, that means we get 37 times as much. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. The way it's set up when we discuss the odds, the odds are discussed with integers. So you are dealing with the fractional format. The numerator is an integer. The denominator is an integer. Anytime the denominator is one in math, we get rid of it. Remember that. But in the concept of a payoff odds and odds, we keep it. That's really the bottom line for that number one. But it may be like it's seven to two. 
Now, what does it mean if we say seven to two? It means really 3.5 times. That's the idea. If we said, for example, nine to two, that means we get 4.5 times. In this case, we get 37 times, or if it's 35 to one, we get 35 times. Law of large numbers and identifying significant results with probabilities, law of large numbers. As a procedure is repeated again and again, the relative frequency probability of an event tends to approach the actual probability, and it applies to behavior over a large number of trials, and it does not apply to any one individual outcome. The rare event rule for inferential statistics. If under a given assumption, the probability of a particular observed event is very small and the observed event occurs significantly less than or significantly greater than what we typically expect with that assumption, we conclude that the assumption is probably not correct. Using probabilities to determine when results are significantly high or significantly low. Significantly high number of successes. X successes among N trials a significant, is a significantly high number of successes. If the probability of X or more successes is unlikely with a probability of 0 0.05 or less. That is, X is significantly high number of successes if uh, the probability of X or more is less than or equal to 0 0.05. Significantly no low number of successes. X successes among N trials is a significantly low number of successes if the probability of X or fewer successes is unlikely with a probability of 0 0.05 or less. That is, X is a significantly low number of successes if the probability of X or fewer is less than or equal to 0 0.05. The value 0.05 is not absolutely rigid. The idea of law of large numbers and identifying the significant results is that there are cases we don't expect it to happen. The probability of something happening is extremely small. But if it happens, it means something is working or something is not working. For example, if there is an intervention, couple, for example, is trying to have an expert to be a boy or a girl specifically, and if they are working with some you know, institution, if it happens that when they look at a number of cases, the probability that, for example, if there are 100 birds and the claim of that institution is that we can make it happen. Uh, for 100 birds, there ends up being, let's say, 52 girls instead of 50 on the average. It's really not that significant, but if it happened to be 70 or 80 or 90, and that is a rare event, then you claim that it is effective. So here's another concept that of law of large numbers. A coin is tossed 100 times and we get 98 heads in a row. Assumption, the coin is fair. A normal assumption when an ordinary coin is tossed. Everybody understands the meaning of a fair coin. A fair coin is that we expect 50-50. And so if the assumption is true, we have observed a highly unlikely event. It can't happen. Okay, that's sort of, boy, is that impossible or what? So according to the rare event rule, therefore, what we just observed is evidence against the assumption on this basis. We conclude the assumption is wrong. The coin can't be fair. It must be loaded. All right. We are continuing with the topic of probability, and we are going to look at addition and multiplication rules. We looked at uh, basic concepts of probability as far as the definition of a probability is concerned. Simple event, sample space, a couple of very, very important concepts to remember when it comes to probability, and that is the probability is always between zero and one. And the sum, the total probability is always one or 100%. We looked at the impossible set the probability is zero, a sure set, the probability is one. Complementary events, probability of A complement, which is normally shown with A with the bar at top, one minus P of A. We looked at the actual odds against an event is defined as probability of A complement over probability of A. And the actual odds in favor would be the reciprocal of that, which gives rise this, to this concept of a net profit. Net profit is the product 
of the payoff odds against an event and the amount of bet. We looked at different approaches. We have the uh, classical probability, empirical probability, and subjective probability. In the case of a classical probability, we just look at cases that have outcomes that are equally likely, and it's basically N of E over N of S. That would be the probability of one happening. It follows the same type when it comes to uh, relative frequency, uh, N of A over N of S, and then subjective probability, things that really are hard to be repeated. So let's go to the new topic. 4.2, addition rule and multiplication rule. Addition rule, a tool to find P of A or B, which is the probability that either event A occurs or event B, or they can happen at the same time, both as the single outcome of a procedure. The word or in the addition rule is associated with the addition of probabilities or union of events. So probability of a or B is the probability in a single trial, event A can occur or B or both of them. So to find probability of A or B, add the number of ways event A can occur and the number of ways B can occur, but add in such a way that every outcome is counted only once. Okay, in other words, if there is a common outcomes, you have to take them out. And of course, you divide by the sample space. I want you to pay attention to this formula. And normally we would say the probability of A union B. Uh, the notation for the union looks like a U. Complementary event was discussed. What we need to remember is that the sum is equal to one or 100%. Obviously, when you have number one, you can see that number two comes out of it or number three. Remember the first one and everything else just follows. So this is the addition rule. We have a couple more concepts we want to discuss here. One of them is disjoint or mutually exclusive. Events A and B are considered to be disjoint. That means mutually exclusive. If they have nothing in common, the notation would be probability of A intersection B is zero. We use a notation that looks almost like an N. And so the thing I wanna add here is the following. A intersection B is an empty set. The notation phi means an empty set. I hope everybody remembers that from the basic set theory that we studied in algebra. Now, take a look at the bottom before we move on. You see the Venn diagram. If you look at the left side, they have something in common. This portion, this is in common between the two events A and B. So, that would be probability of A and B. By the way, if it represents, if the Venn diagram is representing the probability, therefore the total area must be one because the total probability is one. So if you look at the right side, on the other hand, if they have nothing in common, that is called disjoint. Nothing in common. And this is exactly why when you look at the addition rule, the commonality should come out because the common area is considered a part of A as well as B. So if you just add them up without taking it out, you are accounting for it two times. Multiplication rule says, if we wanna find probability of A and B, and by the way, another way of saying this intersection is to write it in this manner, probability of A and B, or probability of A intersection, which is the probability that event A occurs and event B, both of it. The word and in multiplication rule is associated with the multiplication of probabilities. And we'll discuss that further later on. Compound event is any event combining two or more simple events. We have some definition to work with. Let's look at an example. We want to determine which events are mutually exclusive and which are not when a single die is rolled. Let's start with part A. Part A, getting an odd number and getting an even number. What do you think it is? Are they mutually exclusive? Exclusive. Because they have nothing to do with each other. When we look at odd numbers are one, three, or five. Uh, even numbers, two, four, six. 
Therefore, they must be mutually exclusive. How about part B? It says giving a three and getting an odd number. Getting a three and an odd number. Remember, the odd numbers are one, three, and five. So definitely, they are not mutually exclusive. The next one says getting an odd number and getting a number less than four. So getting a number less than four. So what are the numbers less than four? one, two, three. And as you can see, one and three are odd numbers. Therefore, they cannot be mutually exclusive. Finally, getting a number greater than four. Okay, so what are those numbers? Greater than four, five and six. Five is larger, six is larger. And getting a number less than four, obviously, they have nothing in common. Less than four would be one, two, or three, and that's why they, there is nothing in common here. Assume the probability of randomly selecting someone who has sleepwalked in is 0.27. So P sleepwalked is equal to 0.27. If a person is randomly selected, find the probability of getting someone who has not sleepwalked. We are looking at the complementary event, and remember, probability of A plus probability of A bar or A complement is one, so if you want one of them, just subtract one from the other because the sum is one. So probability that has not sleepwalked equals one minus the probability the person has sleepwalked. And it's one minus 0.27, which is simply 0 0.73. So simply put, subtract the probability from one. And that gives you the answer. I'm following the way it's given. But if I was not given this part, and I just had this one, then I would probably define sleepwalking as, let's say, S, for the sake of argument. Then I would say probability of S is equal to 0.27. And probability of S naught would be 1 minus probability of S, and I would plug in. So I like to define the event by a variable to make life easier as we do the writing. In a, in a hospital unit, there are eight nurses and five physicians. Seven nurses and three physicians are females. If a staff person is selected, find the probability that the subject is a nurse or a male. It's important to be able to set up the table to make some sense out of this. And let's do that first in order to answer this. This is extremely important that you try this on your own. If you can make up the table, you're practically done. If you cannot come up with the proper table, you will not get to the answer. I can't emphasize this enough. So we're going to put up the table, but you're going to be able to do this on your own. So first we have the stats and we have, this is a contingency table, males, females, and nurses, physicians, and we put in the uh, given information. So in a hospital unit, there are eight nurses. So right in front of the nurses under the total column, we put eight, and then there are five physicians. So that's how it goes, eight and five. So you put in as you get those numbers. Seven nurses and three physicians are female. So it is the second column that reads females, we're gonna put in seven and three. Okay, so we put those numbers. If a staff person is selected, find the probability that the subject is a nurse or male. So number one, we should be able to finish this by doing the following. Look at the very first row. We have nurses. Under females, we have seven. Under total, we have eight. So how many males we have? Eight minus seven, which is one. Physicians. We have a total of five, three of them are females. So five minus three must be males. And finally, we have the total. If we add up each column, this is what we get. This is the most important step in handling this question. Now that we have that, we want the probability, find the probability that the subject is a nurse or a male. So probability of nurse or male. We are looking at this union of events and so the probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A intersection B, 
That means the probability of nurse plus the probability of males, that probability of N and M, if you will, minus the probability of those that are in common between the nurses and the males. So when we look at nurses, we have a total of eight, so eight out of 13. Males, we have a total of three out of 13. Now, how many of those males are nurses or how many of those nurses are males in common? So it's important to see one way to look at it. Look at the lines that I'm gonna draw this one and this one has this one in common. That's the idea. And that's the answer. Eight plus three minus one over the common denominator of 13. And that's the final answer for this question. Multiplication rule. The probability of A and B is equal to the probability of event A occurs in the first trial and event B occurs in a second trial. Probability of B given A represents the probability of event B occurring after it is assumed that event A has already occurred. To find the probability that event A occurs in one trial and an event B occurs in another trial, multiply the probability of event A by the probability of event B and be sure that the probability of event B is found by assuming that event A has already occurred. This is the multiplication rule and it becomes clear as we look at examples. The idea is that the probability of A and B or the intersection that I like to use a mathematical symbol. Basically, you multiply the probability of A and probability of B if they are independent. If they are not, then you have to pay attention to this conditional probability, probability of A given B, or in this case, B given A. Okay, that's how it's read. We will uh, discuss that as we go through it, and we look at some examples. Independent. Two events, A and B, are independent if the occurrence of one does not affect the probability of the occurrence of the other. Several events are independent if the occurrence of any does not affect the probabilities of the occurrence of the others. If A and B are not independent, they are said to be dependent. Um, I want to discuss this concept because you can read this definition a billion times, and it really doesn't make that much of a sense. I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. It says two events are independent if the occurrence of one doesn't affect the occurrence of the other. What does it mean? Well, I'll show you what it means mathematically. When we come across it, I'll show you with numbers because the definition is, to me at least, it's extremely vague and one may have a different interpretation than the other. But we use numbers to show that events are independent or not. There are cases that are very straightforward when we discuss them, but if we are dealing with the probability and the numbers are given and we have no idea whether the events are independent or not, then we look at the probabilities and we decide. I'll tell you what we mean by that as we come across it again. Uh, sampling in the world of statistics, sampling methods are critically important and the following relationship told Sampling with replacement selections are independent events. Sampling without replacement selections are dependent events. Just to give you an idea of what's happening here, and again, that one is straightforward. Uh, what is not straightforward, the things that we come across and we see, uh, we, it's really confusing in a moment, but what is straightforward? If you consider the following situation, going back to the example of STAT students, we have 40 students. Again, we are just making things up for the sake of argument. There are 40 students. Let's say 21 females, 19 males. We are making things up. So the probability of uh, picking a female, if we pick a student randomly, is 21 over 40. Probability of M randomly, 19 over 40. So I want to explain this concept. It's extremely important. So if we pick a student randomly, uh, what is the probability that students is a female is 21 out of 40 and male is 19 out of 40. Now, if we want to pick another student, well, there are two ways to do that. With replacement, that means the same student that was picked in the first case still has a chance of getting picked. So the probability of females and probability of males stays the same, it never changes. They are independent. However, if you 
are interested in picking, let's say, two students for a committee, to be a member of a committee, then it's not with replacement. We pick one student. And what is the probability that that student is a female? The very first pick, the first choice, would be 21 out of 40. But what happens to the second student? Well, what is the probability that the second student is a female? It really depends. What does it depend on? Depends on what happened in the first place. If we picked a female versus a male in our first choice, then it makes a difference. As far as the denominator is concerned, the denominator goes down to 39. But the numerator, if no female has been picked, the numerator remains as 21. But if one female has been picked, then it goes down to tone. So this is the concept of independency and dependency when it comes to with and without replacement. Finally, probability of A intersection if B is probability of A times probability of B in the case of independence. If not, then the probability, and I put actually here and, and I put the notation here on purpose because I want you to be exposed to both of them, okay? Normally I like to use the notation then it would be the probability of A times the probability of B given A. This is read as given. That means A has already occurred. That would be in the case of a dependent. Let's look at an example. 50 test results from the subjects who use drugs are shown below. A, if two of these 50 subjects are randomly selected with replacement, find the probability the first selected person has a positive test result and the second per selected person has a negative test result. This is with replacement. The first selection is positive and the second selection is negative. So we really use the basic formula of independency as follows. Probability of A intersection B is the probability of A times the probability of B. So what is the probability that the first selection is positive? Okay, we have 45 that have tested positive, so 45 out of 50. And the second one is negative, five tested negative. So five out of 50, and we simplify. So five and 50, they cancel out to one over 10. And then this one gives you nine, this one gives you 10, and that's how you get to nine over 100. So that's an independent case because it was done with the replacement. However, what happens in RP? We're gonna repeat the same thing, but this time without replacement. So when we do without replacement, we have to use the formula at top. Probability of A intersection B is probability of A times the probability of B given that A has occurred. Now, what is the probability of A? The probability of A remains as 45 over 50. That doesn't change. If we choose a person that is selected positive, it's 45 out of 50. That means all the negative ones are intact. All five are intact. However, the total, which was 50, goes down to 49. Probability of A is the same as part A. But what is the probability of B now? It's B given A because A has already occurred and it's without replacement, so we got to account for that. Because A has occurred, the total of 50 has gone down to 49. And now you simplify that one. Reading dependent events and independent events with a 5% guideline. When sampling without replacement and the sample size is no more than 5% of the size of the population, treat the selections as being independent even though they are actually dependent. Okay, let's see what we mean by that. Example 5. Three adults are randomly selected without replacement from the 247,436,830 adults in the U.S. Also assume that 10% of adults in the United States use drugs. Find the probability that the three selected adults all use drugs. So this is actually the explanation of what was that 5% guidelines. And again, that's not a 5% that everybody uses. But just to give you an idea, the fact of the matter is that you're only using three adults, which is a lot less than 5%. Although this is without replacement, and therefore you are dealing with a dependent event. 
they are dependent. I can't emphasize this enough. They are not independent. However, the number that we are using compared to 247 million is so small, definitely less than 5%, then you're going to assume independence. And that's the idea behind that. So with that being the case, the probability that somebody has used it is 10% using drugs. So what we are doing is that we are assuming probability that somebody is using drug and someone else using drug, they are independent. And therefore, each person has a chance of 10%. And if you have three of them, then all of them are the same 0.1. We're going to multiply by each other or 0.1 to the third. So P of all three adults use drugs would be the probability of the first one using drugs, which is 10%. The second one does the same thing, which is 10%. And the last one. In other words, we could write this one as 0 0.1 to the power of, there are three people. Okay, that's a nice shorthand notation. And so the probability that the three selected adults all use drugs will be about one out of 1,000. That's the idea of 5% guideline. When you're dealing with a large population, then sample size, and if you pick and three, then if you picked uh, 10,000 people, again, that would be considered independent because it's a lot less than 5% when you calculate it. With that being the case, let's look at this one, redundancy. Redundancy, important application of the multiplication rule. The principle of redundancy is used to increase the reliability of many systems. Our eyes have passive redundancy in the sense that if one of them fails, we continue to see. An important finding of modern biology is that genes in an organism can often work in place of each other. Engineers often design redundant components so that the whole system will not fail because of the failure of a single component. Modern aircraft are now highly reliable and one factor contributing to that reliability is the use of redundancy, whereby critical components are duplicated so that if one fails, the other will work. For example, the Airbus 310 twin engine airliner has three independent hydraulic systems to move and activate landing gear, flaps, and brakes. So if any one system fails, full flight control is maintained with another functioning system. For a typical flight, the probability of an aircraft's engine hydraulic system for failure is 0.002%. If the aircraft had only one hydraulic system, what is the probability that the aircraft's flight control would work for a flight? This is the complementary event. It has a chance of 0.002 to fail. So one minus that would be the complementary event. And the chance of not failing is 99.8% or 0 0.998. An aircraft has three independent hydraulic systems. What is the probability that on a typical flight control can be maintained with a working hydraulic system? They are independent. And so because they are independent, even if one of them works, they will work. So the only way that it fails, if all of them fail, if the system is independent, it can really save lives. And so all of them can fail with the following probability, 0.002 to the third power. Okay. One easy notation would be 0. 0, 0, 002 to the power of however many are independent systems to the third. So this is the probability of failing, and therefore, complementary event is answer one minus this. And as you can see, the probability is almost zero. All right, let's look at the last page. A simulation of a procedure is a process that behaves the same way as a procedure so that similar results are produced. In many experiments, random numbers are used in the simulation naturally occurring events. Below are some ways to generate random numbers. Simulation, sometimes we can't actually do the experiment. Simulation will do the job. Here's gender selection. 
Gender selection. When testing techniques of gender selection, medical researchers need to know probability values of different outcomes, such as the probability of getting at least 60 girls among 100 children. Assuming that male and female births are equally likely, describe a simulation that results in genders of 100 newborn babies. So we want to simul uh, see if there is any simulation that does that. And of course, basically, you look at the concept of two outcomes that are equally likely. And that's the idea behind that. So with that case, this would be solution one. Fair cone means probability of heads and tails are the same, 50%, one half. And then you look at that and see what you get. For example, first you have to decide of which one represents which. Uh, heads, for example, female, tails, males, or vice versa. It makes no difference. Make a decision and go. Decision has to be made before we start. Then would be going with zeros and ones. A zero represents one gender. One represents another one. Again, make a decision and then go. Okay. For example, zero represents male and one represents female. So you want to change this to female. The next this involves complements and conditional probability. The basic concepts of probability were discussed. There are things that you sh really can't afford to forget ever, and that is the probability has two essential characteristics, and that is the probability is always between zero and one, inclusively, and the sum must be equal to one or 100%. Then uh, the rest of them were explained, the impossible set, the sure set, the complementary event, probability of A naught is one minus probability of A. The actual odds against an event, A is defined as probability of A complement over the probability of A, and it is expressed in the form of A to B, where both of them are integers. The actual odds in favor of event A is the reciprocal of that, which is probability of A over the probability of its complement. And finally, it gives us this net profit by definition. Net profit is the product of payoff odds against event A and the amount of bit. Addition and multiplication rules. I can't emphasize the importance of understanding how this addition rule works. Understand why we take out the probability of A intersection B. If there is anything in common between A and B, it has been accounted for two times, once for A, once for B, and that's why we take it out. So the probability of A union B is defined as probability of A plus probability of B, minus the probability of A intersection B. The multiplication rule, it depends whether we are dealing with the independent or a dependent case. If you are dealing with independent, probability of A times the probability of B. It's that simple. If they are dependent, then probability of A times the probability of B given A. So probability of A intersection B in the case of dependency, becomes the probability of A times probability of B given A. We'll discuss that uh, conditional probability with more details. And of course, the complementary event was discussed, and we are going to move on. Key concept. Extend the use of multiplication rule to include the probability that among several trials, we get at least one of the specified event. Consider conditional probability, the probability of an event occurring when we have additional information that some other event has already occurred. We provide a brief introduction to Bayes' theorem. The idea of a conditional probability refers to the fact that something has already occurred. And what happens in essence is that the sample space shrinks as a result. Complements the probability of at least one. When finding the probability of some event occurring at least once, we should understand the following. At least one has the same meaning as one or more. The complement of getting at least one particular event is that you get no occurrences of that event. P, uh, C, at least one occurrence of event A equals one minus P, no occurrences of event A. 
it's important to know why we go over this in this manner, because if you want to find the probability of at least one, it may be difficult if you get uh, to go with that literally, meaning one, two, and go all the way to n. However, calculating the probability of none may be easy. If this is easy, then we calculate that subtracted from one. So that's the idea of at least one, at least one. That's why we use it in this manner. So probability of at least one is equal to one minus the probability of none. Let's look at this example. If a couple plans to have three children, assume equally likely and independency. So what is the probability that they will have at least one girl? So there are a couple of ways to approach this. And first, we're going to look at what we have seen before. There is nothing brand new. We did this. We had the sample space. So let's look at the sample space that we had. The sample space that we came up with and the tree diagram, I'm referring you to the example that we have seen. We can see that it becomes seven over eight. Let me just quickly remind you of a couple of things here. First of all, when we say at least one girl, I hope you see that this is good. This is good. As long as you see a G there, it's good. It's good. We want at least one, good. All of them are good. This is no good, okay? Because we want at least one girl. That's the idea, how we get to that. There are seven of them that are good, so seven out of eight. How did we come up with that? I want to refresh your memory about this three diagram, GB. You can go back to previous notes. And so this is G as an example, and you get G, G, G. This is B and you get B, B, B. And I let you fill up the rest on your own. So this is something we have seen. We can answer it this way. It works fine. All is okay. Now from the point of view of at least one that was discussed and at least one means one minus the probability of none. Okay, we want to discuss it from that point of view. None would be that all of them are boys, all boys. The probability that they're all boys would be one half to the third, one half to the third. If we were to calculate this, it's easier that way. And one minus that is the answer. When we have a case with three children, it's really not that big of a deal, it's fairly simple. But the more complicated the question, the better this way. If we have five or six or seven, it may not be easy to use the tree diagram or write out the sample space. For example, if you have five and you want at least one girl, then it's one half to the power of five and you subtract it from one. So therefore, there is a probability of seven out of eight that if a couple has three children, at least one of them is a girl. Now, the next part is asking, what is the probability that they will have at most one girl, in which case at most means if we have one girl is fine and if we have no girl is fine. That's why a shorthand notation is P of zero and P of one. So in essence, you can go look at your sample space, P of zero, that means no girls, which is one out of eight. And then probability of one, just look for one G. One G, this one has three, two, two, so one G. There's only one G here. There's only one G here. And there's only one G here. So those three give us three over eight. And then the last one is the probability of zero. No Gs, if you will. That's how we arrive at this answer. So at least one versus at most one. Here's the next one. Assume that 3% of ties sold in the United States are bow ties B. If four cons customers who purchased a tie are randomly selected, find a probability that at least one purchased a bow tie. 
This is an example where complementary events and using concept of the P of A plus P of A not equals one, as well as P of at least one is one minus P of none is really helpful. First and foremost, it's important for us to understand when we are dealing with statistics, we are really dealing with word problems. So let's write what's given. So probability of B, and B stands for the bow tie, the probability of getting bow ties would be 0.03 or 3%. And therefore, the complementary event for that probability of B naught would be 97%. And in this case, N equals 4. There are other approaches on discrete random variable and the next chapter, but just the way it is here. And so in this case, we are saying that if four customers who purchase, so N equals four, find the probability that at least one purchased a bow tie. So first let's figure out what is the probability of no bow ties when we have four customers. Remember, no bow tie for one customer. The probability is 97%. But what happens for four, we are assuming in dependency. So probability of no bow ties would be 0 0.97 to the power of four because there are four of them. Let's say there are 10 of them to the power of 10. I wrote out for you that it means probability of B naught times the next one and the next one and the next one. But an easy way would be to write down as 0 0.97 to the power of four. And that means the probability of no bow ties. So probability of at least one would be probability that is calculated as one minus the probability of none. One minus the probability of none. So one minus the probability of no bow ties, which means one minus that 0.885, or, or if you didn't write that intermediate step, one minus P of no bow ties, would be one minus 0.97 to the power of four. We already have calculated that as 0.885, so one minus 0.885, and the answer is 0 0.115. So if four customers who purchase the tie are randomly selected, what is the probability of at least one purchasing a bow tie is 0 